Amen. Uh, all right, so uh, tonight we're going to take a look at uh, what does it mean to take up your cross? Uh, what does it mean to take up your cross? This is um, found in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, I've selected uh, just Mark uh, chapter uh, 8, verses 34 through 38 that we'll look at, but you can find this same uh, exact scripture passage in Matthew 16, Mark 8, Luke 9. Um, and Jesus says uh, here that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, and you may have heard, you've, you've read this certainly, you've heard it quoted before, um, but, but I'm asking, what does, what does it actually mean to take up your cross daily? What is that referring to? Let's look at it in context uh, as we begin and, and look at um, uh, Mark uh, uh, chapter 8, uh, verses 34 through 38. It says, Then he called the crowd to him uh, along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What good is it for a man? Well, excuse me. I don't know. I can't follow Joe. Uh, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels." A lot of quoted scripture passages, you know, in these verses here. Um, so I ask here in your notes, what's your initial thoughts about what verse 34 says? Um, not, not what I've written on the paper, uh, but what, what's your initial thoughts when you, when you read uh, him saying, if anyone will come after me, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Okay. Well, I, I read ahead, but my, so some, some of it's not here, but what I think about is being willing to sacrifice something that you might get if you didn't follow Christ and being willing to sacrifice that while you're following him. Deny your, your flesh. Deny flesh. Worldly things. Okay. Well, denying worldly things. Okay, um, and, and as I put it here uh, in, your, in your notes, I want to look at what he did not mean. And, and you hear this misquoted uh, and misrepresented a lot uh, in sermons and then people just kind of quoting it in a, in a time of a struggle or something like that. Um, but Jesus did not mean that the cross should be interpreted as a burden that we must carry in our lives. A strained relationship, a thankless job, a physical illness, for instance. So somebody will say, oh, you know, this, this illness that I have, that's just my cross that I've got to bear, okay? Uh, this um, job that I've got and it's horrible, that's just my cross that I have to bear. I've heard people say that time and time again, and that is a total uh, misunderstanding of what Jesus is saying. This is not a burden. He is not talking about uh, just a thorn in your flesh uh, kind of an issue, you know, here. You to take up your burdens every day and follow him. He's not, that, that wouldn't even, it wouldn't make sense. He's like, hey, you got all these burdens. What does it say about burdens, by the way? He says, cast your burdens you know, uh, on me, cast your anxieties on me because uh, he, he cares for you. So he's not, he, he doesn't say here, hey, just take that sack of burdens that you cast it on me and throw it on your back and come, come follow me with it like you're a hobo or something, you know, with it on your back. No, that, that, but, but that's how, again, that's why I always say I really can't stand people using the Bible verses as a cliche, uh, as something you put on a mug or a t-shirt or something like that. So he's not, he's not saying that. Um, we kind of, with uh, self-pity and pride, we say that that's our cross we have to carry. And, and I say it that way because we're always looking, oh, look at me. You know, just look at what I got to deal with. 
I got to deal with this, this, this problem or that problem or, 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 or whatever. Um, uh, and put this in context, when Jesus carried his cross, all right, up the Golgotha's hill to be crucified, uh, I don't think he had on his mind something symbolic. He knew what this meant, that this wasn't symbolism, that this was literally um, uh, a real thing that he had on his back. And all of those people that would have heard this during this time period understood it to be uh, in the context of, 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 of crucifixion. Um, only for us, 2,000 years removed from crucifixion, do we look back at the cross as something that is beautiful and glorious uh, and, 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 and it shows us atonement, forgiveness, grace, and love and all of that. But during this time when uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke were writing this and Jesus spoke, when he spoke this and when they wrote it down for other people to, uh, to look at, do you think that those people this close to the crucifixion thought that, oh, the crucifixion was glorious and wonderful in and, and a, and a, and a picture? They, they thought it was horrible, okay? The, the, the Messiah had died. You know, it was, it was later that the disciples began to think back to what he had said at, at the Last Supper and all of that and put it together and say, oh, I understand what he meant now. But uh, for, for a person, you know, in, in this time period, they understood crucifixion to represent a torturous death. Uh, when you said, take up your cross, uh, they were not going, oh, isn't that just some symbolism of, of my little burden that I have? No, they understood it to be a really, really horrible thing. Um, and, and, and then you know, not only did the Romans crucify people, but the Romans required people to carry either the whole cross or at least that cross beam part. Uh, and there's historical debate as to whether they carried the whole cross. I, I don't believe that, that, that most of the time they carried the whole cross. It would not have been humanly possible to have carried the entire cross that was stuck down in the ground. They were way too heavy. This was not the days of particle wood uh, and, and things like that. This was a tree. Uh, and, 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 and they pretty much just carried that uh, cross beam like this. And, but there is still historical debate you know, about that. Even that was extremely, extremely heavy because what they would do, those stakes basically stood there on, on Golgotha's Hill the whole time and they would give you that cross beam and they would take a rope and they would pull it up and it would go into place, yada, yada, uh, if you look at the history of it. But, but they understood taking up your cross, whether it's the cross beam or the whole thing, they understood that to represent you dying and you dying in, in a most uh, horrific way. So when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, what he was meaning was that somebody should be willing to die in order to follow him. When he says that daily you are to take up your cross and follow me, that you should be willing every day to die. Now, does he mean that you should be willing every day to go take a bullet for him? Or that's No, that's not what he's talking about. Physical death is not what he's talking about. He's talking about dying to self. Dying to self. Uh, that you should be able to absolutely surrender to him. Um, and, and I put here in your notes this, this picture, and uh, this is a, a, a quote from Andrew Murray, uh, and and uh, do we have it on the screen? Uh, but humility is perfect quietness. So if you're absolutely surrendering, all right, then you must, uh, to do that, you've got to humble yourself to the utmost, okay? Uh, you, you can't surrender in this way unless you know how to humble yourself. And this is what Andrew Murray says in his book, Humility. Humility is perfect quietness of heart. It is to expect nothing to wonder at nothing that is done to me, to feel nothing done against me. It is to be at rest when nobody praises me and when I am blamed or despised. It is to have a blessed home in the Lord where I can go, to, go in, shut the door, and kneel to my Father in secret and, and am at peace as in deep sea of calmness when all around and above is trouble." 
And there is no other way that I, that there's no sense in me trying to give you any better because Andrew Murray is recognized as having the single best idea of, and his book, Humility, uh, which Jim bought me a set of things by Andrew Murray, uh, I recommend for you to read. Uh, it, they, are, they are wonderful uh, books, especially when it comes to topics like uh, humility. This man, I, I, I'm going to sell myself short, but I don't know that I'll ever get to where Andrew Murray was able to get in his life when it comes to understanding how to be humble. But that is, that is a, when you talk about what, what is Jesus asking of us, when you look at that, to expect nothing. When you die to yourself, you're not talking about yourself, to expect not a single thing, to wonder at nothing that is done to you. Can you, can you even fathom this? I mean, this is what we're supposed to be doing, but this is like, whoa. Um, uh, to feel nothing done against you, to rest when nobody praises you, you know? Uh, th those, those, this, this is to die to yourself. When it says, when he says, if you look in verse 34, he says, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself. What does denying yourself mean? It doesn't mean to say, I don't know if I'm a person, you know? I mean, good grief, it means to go without, it means to humble, it means to surrender. And when you do that, it means that nothing is about us. Absolutely nothing is about us. And you say, well, doesn't God care about me? Well, yes, he cares about you. And if he cares about you, you ought not be worrying about yourself because he's got you. Now that, again, as human beings, practically do we walk like that all the time? No. Do we trust God like that? No. But that's where we are aspiring to be is the point. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So he, that taking up your cross was a further explanation of the denial. He said, okay, I said deny, my, deny yourself, but let me let you understand what I mean. Die. Take up your cross. And, and, and die to yourself. And he said, and the point to get you to was, and follow me. Because if you're not denying yourself, and you got self here, are you truly following, following him step by step? No, you're looking at yourself, and you go, oh, let me see. It's, it's Peter, the example of Peter, okay? Peter was doing good. He was following the Lord. He's walking on the water. And all of a sudden, he thought, oh, the wind, the wave. And how, am I on, how am I standing on this water? And he began to sink. Because what did Jesus say to him? He said, Peter, why did you doubt? He, he, was, he was doubting himself. He was doubting Christ. He was looking at the stuff. If you, if you are following Christ and your eyes are set there, then you're following what Galatians says, that you are in step with the Spirit. Where he steps, you step, and you are just right along with him the entire, the entire time. Um, so let's take a look at the verses following in verses 35 and 30, through 37. And this gives you a little bit more of a further understanding of what he means in verse 34. He says, for whoever wants to save his life, will lose it. You think, man, why is he talking in circular language here? You know, what, is, what is going on? Uh, he's, he's meaning what he's saying and saying what he means. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. What's that mean? If you want to get saved, though, what do you got to do? You got to lose this life that you've got now. You, you, can't, you can't continue in this life and say, I'm saved. He said, if you want to save this life you've got, you got to lose it. You got to die. You got to die to it. You got to deny it. It's got to go. So you mean we can't have our best life now? No, Joel. <laughs> Stupid book anyway. Uh, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't want to do that. It's a Catholic thing. Um, but th then, he, then he goes on and he says, but, because, he, he, I mean, he knows. He knows what he just said. People are going. He said, but wait. Whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. So he says, yes, if you want to save your life, you got to lose it. But I'm not telling you to give your life for Corey. 
or to give your life for some cult, you know, leader somewhere else, like you've seen back in the 80s when they said, hey, hey it's just take, you know, suicide pills and, and they all died and thought they met Jesus, you know, the next moment and that kind of crazy stuff. He says, if you die for me. Now, is this talking about martyrdom? No. Some people have used this and, and, and you could construe it that way. And you could say dying for him in martyrdom like, you know, uh, 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 Peter may have done and, and, and different ones have done. But I don't believe in context he's talking about in any of these verses physical death. He's talking about dying to your flesh. You mentioned flesh earlier. Uh, dying to yourself in that way. Um, but again, that's a one other way that, you know, you can look at verse 35 and say, well, he's talking about martyrdom and, and physical death, but I believe you're taking it out of context. Um, whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. And he's talking about you quit following your ways and go after me and do things for the gospel. All right. And in verse 36, he says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul. So again, that verse, you know, has, has, has been widely used, and I use it, and he, he is uh, talking about here, you're going after your own life and all of your worldly things, and you get all of this stuff in life. Your 401k is at its highest. You know, you got all the proper uh, material possessions, cars, and iPads, whatever the case may be, uh, and you've got everything this world has to offer, yet you're not dying to yourself, you're not saved, you're not living for Christ, then you're going to forfeit your soul when physical death does come to you. Okay? What, and, 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 and I think the King James says, what profit a man? Okay? What good, what do you gain what do you gain to gain the whole world? What do you get? <laughs> right to it. Um, you do, absolutely. But, but you do gain certain things, you know, on a positive side, right? Whatever you have in this life is it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You, 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 get, you get wealth and worldly... Enjoy it while it's yeah, you get wealth and worldly success and... And, and, and all of that great stuff, you get to enjoy this life. You get to have what Joel Osteen said, your best life now. Because what's coming ain't going to be so great. So that's why his book title is Stupid. If this is your, if this is your best life now. Why would he name it that? I, well, anyway. Um, if this is your best life now, then you've gained the world and forfeited your soul. Clearly, right? Okay. Uh, and, and so that, that, that is not. The, every funeral, it doesn't make sense then. Why we have hope and all that stuff. Why don't we go, man, they sure, they sure you know, died at 56 years. Uh, but we still had more time to gain some more. You know, no, our best life is later. This is not the best time. If you gain the world, you may have forfeited your soul. <coughs> He's not saying that you taking advantage of blessings in this life means you forfeited your soul. That's not what this says. It is not talking against worldly wealth and possession. It's simply asking the question, what would you truly gain if you had everything in the world but you forfeited your soul and went to hell, okay? Some people have tried to say that worldly wealth is a, a death nail, but that's not what it's saying. The point is, what, is you, what are you truly profiting? And I'm saying you are profiting temporary success in exchange for eternal damnation. That is not a gain. Verse 37 says, or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? What can you give in exchange for your soul? Your 401k? Your, your, that nothing, there's nothing that you can give in exchange for your soul. You don't get to barter at that point. He said, but you, you, you forfeit your, your soul 
Okay, you give it up. And he goes, okay, what can you give in exchange? You get to that point. This is not like, and you got to understand, in ancient cultures like the Egyptians, they would get to the gates, you know, uh, with Anubis, which was the god of the, uh, uh, the underworld. They, would, they believed you would get to the gate, and if you died with wealth, then you could buy your, your way into the afterlife. That's why they would put, you know, gold coins and things in, in Norse, you know, mythology and, and the, and the uh, Vikings and stuff. They put coins and all. And that was to pay the ferryman uh, to go across the boat. You know, out there, you've seen it in movies and things like that. He's, uh, Jesus is asking here, what can you uh, exchange? What can you give to barter with your soul? And the, the answer for us as Christians is nothing. There is nothing that you can give to exchange for your soul. If you forfeited it, that's it. It's over. You don't get to go up there and say, oh, I made, you know what, I made a mistake. Listen, I, I got a big house. Let me, you, you take that house. And you think about the rich man and Lazarus when he died. He, he, he said, you know, I'm in torment in these flames. He wanted some water and you know, you can't, we can't go across there. There's an abyss. And he said, well, at least go and you know, go tell my brothers. And they said, he's got Moses and the prophets. They'll listen to him. When that time comes, when hell happens or heaven or you know, whichever place you go, that's it. There is an exchange that takes place after that. Uh, and he ends in verse 38 beautifully, I think. Uh, and he says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, and now this is 2,000 years ago, and he's saying that this is an adulterous and sinful generation. He said, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels, okay? Um, so, you know, uh, the, the point, as I said, is you, you, you know, you, you're dying to, dying to yourself, uh, giving up all of these things that we have uh, in, this, in this world and not letting them get in the way uh, of Christ. And um, uh, I say here, and I underline this in your notes, that truly, uh, they were not able to put to death their own ideas, plans, and desires and exchange them for his. And this is talking about the, the people during Christ's time, they were, looking for, they were looking for a Messiah, but they wanted somebody who was going to release them from the Roman occupiers. They wanted somebody that was going to be a political hero uh, you know, to them. They were looking for just themselves. They were looking for them to not have to go uh, be under this type of oppression. Um, but following Jesus is easy when life runs smoothly. Our true commitment to him is revealed during trials. You say, I have great faith. Come talk to me when you go through something really, really bad. Then you'll find out whether you got great faith or not. You say, I trust God 100%. Great. Come, to, come, come talk to me when you got a diagnosis of stage four cancer. Do you trust him then? Do, when your bank account is zero, yet you have a very important bill, do you trust him then? Oh, I mean, again, it's easy to trust him when the going is well. It's easy to say, I'm a wonderful follower of Christ. I'm, I'm denying myself every day. No, you're not. You're... you're Counting the bills every, every day. Not the bills, but I mean the, the money, <laughs> you know, uh, on there every day. You're counting the, the, the gold coins and you're saying there's not a, there's not a problem. Um, but Jesus assured us that trials would come in John 16, 33. And I just referenced the, the verse here in John 16, 33. He tells us there will be trials and tribulations that come to you. Um, uh, discipleship. And, and following Christ, okay, when you follow Christ, that requires sacrifice. And Jesus never hid that from us. He never said in his word, if you come follow me, your life is going to be a bed of roses. He said the direct opposite. He plainly says here, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. He plainly said, uh, as I referenced in John 16, 33, trials and tribulations are going to come. He said, hey, if it happened to me, it's going to happen to you. It's what he was saying to them. 
But yet in our churches, though, we, we stand up and I, oh, you know what? If you get saved, that's it. That's all you got to worry about. Just come down here. You sick. You struggling in life. Just come get saved and everything's going to be hunky-dory. That's a lie. Will everything be hunky-dory? Yes. So it's not necessarily a lie. It sends the wrong message, though. And the way I've illustrated that to people, and I can't remember where I read this, it was this illustration that uh, this guy gets on this plane, and the uh, flight attendant comes up to him, and she says, listen, here's this humongous parachute, you know, uh, satchel book bag thing. Put this on, and this is going to make your flight just so much more comfortable. You're going to be able to sleep better, uh, you know, kick back in your chair and all. And he goes, Oh, that's awesome. It's going to make my flight better. I like something. It's going to make my flight better. He puts it on, he buckles it up. He sits down in the seat, you know, and he's three feet from the back of the seat. And he's just, his just butt's only on the seat about this much. He's like, I can't even sit here. And he, and he straight says, But hey, she said it's supposed to be all good and make everything well. And so he, he deals with it for a little bit. He's trying to buckle the seat belt. And he can't get it around him. And, and finally, you know, he smarted up after about 10, 15 minutes or so. He said, this is trash. He takes that parachute off. He throws it in the floor. He sits back and seat buckles up. The plane crashes and he dies. Okay. Second circumstance happens is the, he gets on the plane. Flight attendant says, listen, 99% chance this plane's going to crash. I need you to put this parachute on because in the event that that happens, you're going to be able to jump out. It's going to save your life. It may, it may make your flight, you know, not as pleasant sometimes. It, you may not be able to sit here in the seat and be as comfortable. You may have trouble buckling your seatbelt, but it's going to save your life. You're going to take it off? You think the man took it off? He didn't care if he could buckle that seatbelt. He kept that parachute on. And that's the same way with Christianity. We, te- we sell people this idea that, hey, you don't have to deny yourself. Hey, you can just live like you used to live. Get a card that says that I got, I got out of hell free. And you're going to be able to present that to Jesus at judgment day. And he's going to say, great, you lived like hell. Just come on into heaven. No. And we tell people that, it's, that your life is going to be perfect the moment you get saved. You're going to have your best life now, as Joel Osteen says in his book. And people realize that they still get sick, tornadoes still hit your house, all of these other things, and they go, what they sold me was a lie. So they leave the faith that they probably wasn't a part of in the first place. But when you realize that it's not about you at all, as Andrew Murray's quote in here puts, that it's all about Christ. And at the end of the day, we're running a race to get somewhere else. Then you keep running no matter what. Because it ain't about this world. It ain't about this life. It's about something greater than this. And that's what Paul understood uh, as well. Um, When... And that's a, that's, a, that's a different gospel presentation than you hear from people. Uh, I put here in your notes that um, uh, about these three people in Luke 9, 57 through 62, and I didn't want to preach necessarily on this, but there were these three people, and they seemed to want to follow Jesus, but he kind of questioned them further, and he knew that they were a little bit half-hearted, um, and, and he knew that they were counting the cost to follow him, and, and he kind of put on, took them to task a little bit here and let them know what was really going, it was really going to cost them to follow him um, and because and, and, he knew that those people were not really going to be willing to give up themselves and, and simply uh, you know, follow him. But he, he appears in there to dissuade them because he's telling them about all the costs. Isn't that a different gospel presentation? That's what I was talking about, about the parachute. That's the way I present it to people. Because that's the way Christ did. I say, listen, the moment you get saved, I can guarantee you Satan is fixing to be knocking at your door tomorrow, today, right now. Because you're making a decision today that is going to make him mad. You know, you're in, you know, for the ladies and, and men who are in Life Springs and Billings House and they're here and, and in the midst of some great struggles. I never once talked to somebody and said, hey, you keep on coming to church and you're never going to have a temptation ever again. What? No way. You, st- you start going to church and them temptations start pouring on you like an avalanche 
Because Satan's going, no. And I say in, in Matthew chapter 3 at the end, uh, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And he'd come up and, and there was God and the, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And God said, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. In Matthew chapter 4 it says, then, comma, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by Satan. And that, and I may be stretching you know, that being so close, but the point is, when there's a mighty move of the Holy Spirit, Satan comes knocking at your door every time. And I let people know, you get saved, you just put a target on your back, but that's okay. Because you're batting on Jesus' team now, so you ain't got to worry about that. But I don't, I don't try to sell them something that ain't. That ain't true. Um, how many people will respond to an altar call that went like this? Come follow Jesus and you may face the loss of friends, family, reputation, career, possibly even your life. Oh, they just flood to the altar, wouldn't they? <laughs> they really should. But that's what Jesus was saying if you go back and read Luke 9. He was telling people that you're going to be cost to this. And isn't there cost? I lost friends. We'll go through some questions here in just a moment. Um, but I put, I put here in your notes, the number of false converts would definitely decrease. The number of people running down to an altar that are making professions of faith that is not real would go down if you were telling them the true story. Uh, uh, and, and that's what Jesus was saying even here in, in, in Mark chapter 8, that there are costs to following him. Um, so if you wonder if you're ready to take up your cross, consider these questions here. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your closest friends? You got somebody who, who's wanting to get saved? You ask them. Are you, are you willing to maybe lose your friends? Guarantee you, 20 friends. Law. Anyway, I don't even like to say friends, you know, but I was alone when I started following the Lord. I had, I had lots of people I thought were friends, but I started serving the Lord, and it was like, oh, he's a party pooper. We don't, we don't want to be around him no more. Thank God, because I wouldn't be here at 32. It would have taken me another 30 years to get back right if I'd stayed with them folks, because I'm watching them now. Some of them, some of them have done, have done better, Okay. Uh, are you willing to follow Jesus if it means alienation from your family? Now, you, this doesn't apply as much to us, but think about somebody in, in China, somebody in a foreign country who is forbidden for you to even associate with somebody who's a Christian. When, they, when, when Charisma, who has been here before, when she, is, when she made a choice to follow Christ, her family cut her off. You know, she couldn't, she, she, well, excuse me, she couldn't tell them because they would. I'm sorry. They didn't cut her off because they didn't know. She, if she had told them, and she was so scared, she didn't tell you, she, 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 I, I couldn't tell them. Her husband got killed uh, by the, well, the train in River North, and she was actually visiting them in India. Uh, and the coroner, Leon Jones, called her and said that she could not even show remorse because she wasn't even supposed to be married to somebody who was here and it was a Christian and all the stuff like that. She, 10 days she had to wait to get a plane to come back to see the body. We don't know what that's like because we live in a Christ, you know, Christian association nation who are associated with it. But in a lot of places they, had to, you know, they, they risk being alienated from their own family. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means the loss of your reputation? If, if you're losing your reputation for following Christ, you probably had a bad one to begin with. <laughs> okay. But are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? Sitting there at lunch today with, uh, with, with a guy that I, I've, I've never met personally, but we've seen each other on Zoom. But I'm, I'm mentoring a, uh, a, a young guy in Dublin uh, to, to be a manager. And he knows I'm a preacher. And we sat there and we went to a pizza place and we sat down at the table. And I said, hey, Taylor, I'm going to bless my food. You know, are you, are you all right? And he, oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I wasn't going to sit there and go, hey, hold on a minute. And then say something. You know, I, I mean, if he's, if he's good with it, we're going to pray together, you know, here. And, you know, uh, my company is fine with that, by the way. But I wouldn't have cared what company I work for. If he had went back and said something, you know, if I get fired for the cause of Christ, whatever, I, 
You know, I, I wish they would, because I'm a squeaky wheel, buddy. <laughs> that that would that would I would call Ken Nugent in a minute. Um, but <laughs> we we would have we would have seen something. Um, but and I would have had a bigger bigger platform. But I'm saying, you know, there are people that 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 are working in jobs right now that if they were to talk or say something. You know, they would lose their job. I couldn't be in a place like that because I certainly would lose my job. And, and, I, and I'm so, I'm, I can tell you this clearly because I've worked for companies like that. It's never shut me up. Not one time. Never shut me up. I've prayed for people over the teller line before, right in the middle of the lobby. They asked me, they asked me to pray, and I felt the Lord leading me to have done that. If I got fired for that, well, whatever. But you have to, you, there are people that struggle, you know, with that. I'm not saying that you've got to be in your job and stop you know, being a surgeon and go over here and, you know, read your Bible and leave somebody open on the operating table. That, you've got to do your job. God doesn't say for you to not do that, but you know what I mean when I, when I was talking about that, that stuff. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your life? And that's, boy, that's that question where there's this church full of all these people and they're praising the Lord and those masked gunmen come in the back and they said, all right. Anybody in here that will not renounce Christ, we're going to blow your head off. And 90% of the people ran out the door. And the gunmen, they, some deacons, I, I'll tell the story like this. It was the deacons of the church, and they pulled their hats off. And they said, all right, preacher, here's your real church. And walked out the door. Is that a true story? No. I hope not anyway. I really hope not. Uh, but but it, it, it puts the point out there that if you come into, let, let's say you went into a big mega church or you went into this church and, and, and they went up and put the gun to everybody's head and said, listen, if you don't renounce Jesus Christ right now, I'm going to pull this trigger and you really know that they're going to do that. What do you do? You remember the story of the girl at Columbine? And they wanted her to do that. And the story goes that she didn't and they shot her. It's easy for you to say, yes, I'll do that. It's easy for me to sit here and say, yes, I'll do that. But I've never been under that kind of a threat. But many people in this world are. In places, like I said, like China. If they were to find them underground churches out there, they put them in jail, they, they can torture them. It's not, it's not as bad in China as it is in Iran and what they do to those people over there. But we are blessed. Um, and, and, and that's what I say you know, next here. In some places around the world, those consequences are reality. Not necessarily for you and I, um, but are you willing? And that's, the, that's why the, I phrased your questions you know, like that. And following Jesus doesn't necessarily mean all of that stuff is going to happen to us. But the point is, are we willing to take up our cross? Are you willing to pay uh, or to, to have some cost um, uh, to, to your own self? Um, um, but look at Mark chapter 8, verse 35 again. Um, the reward is worth the price. Jesus says uh, in, in this verse here, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me, for the gospel, will save it. Um, and, and then, of course, he talks to us about being, being ashamed. We'll be, we'll be saved. Um, but I asked the last question is, are you ashamed? Because right now in this country, uh, if you looked across the, the, the political uh, spectrum, you looked across our churches, you, you looked you know, at what's wrong with America. What's wrong with America is not that the government decided to, to delete prayer from schools. I know that makes for a good Facebook post. You know, uh, what, what, would sa what would save America right now is a picture of a bunch of kids praying in school. Yeah, that would save America right now. Put prayer back in school. Do you know the fact of the matter that they never outlawed the fact that you could pray in school? They never outlawed that at all. They only outlawed that the teachers would lead you in prayer. But nobody ever said that the kids couldn't band together and pray. Nobody ever said that at all. They have see you at the poles still, and the kids gather around the flagpoles at the schools, on the school property, and they pray. I read my Bible openly and prayed uh, in school every day of high school. So, you know, in, the, in the quiet time in the morning uh, when we had announcements, I prayed and read my Bible. I had one girl sit in front of me and said, I couldn't do that. I said, you're a liar. I said, she can't do it and lead me in it, but I can, talking about the teacher. 
The problem is that people, people today had just went hook, line, and sinker with all of this stuff, and we walk around like little ducks just following the people. Nobody has ever stripped us of our rights to publicly go and follow Jesus Christ. And if they do try to come against us, well, you push back. You don't just sit back and take it. And what we have in our country right now is that people that think they, that we are entitled, we think that, you know, we, we ought to just get the benefits of heaven without any personal cost whatsoever. We preach free gift of, uh, of salvation, and, and that's never in the Bible. Where in the Bible does it say free gift? Does the Bible ever say free gift? Do you know that? You, you look it up? Not in any reputable translation that I know. Was it free? Whoever said it was free, it wasn't free. It, was, it cost Jesus his very life's blood. It's free to us. But when you take that gift, you have to die to yourself. So it's not necessarily free in that way. But the point is, you can't die to self and then get saved. You've got to get saved, and then you, die, then, you, then you have the ability to die to self. You can't die to self. You can't get right until you get saved. Okay? You get, you get saved to get right. But people are ashamed today to stand up for Christ. People think, and we may mention this a little bit later, people think voting for a particular party is standing up for Christ. Be careful with that, by the way. Be careful with that. I'm going to tell you something right now in closing has nothing really to do with what I'm about to say, but there is not a political party that I'm aware of that is a champion for Jesus Christ. Not one. Okay. I, I preached a couple of weeks ago that it never was supposed to be that our government was the protector of the church. There's a separation between church and state. But be careful to think that you are not being ashamed by saying I'm voting for this particular party. I don't need you to espouse your political views all the time. You need to be following Jesus Christ and espousing his word. Okay, That's what we're after. And that may mean that that leads you to some other political party. I'm not saying that at all. But you just saying I vote this way does not. In and, there's a lot of lost people that are in both major political parties and all the rest of them. So it is not a, there's not a Christian party uh, that is out there. Being ashamed of the gospel is not willing to stand up. For Jesus Christ and cowering down. We don't need to do that. We need to stand up. And the more we did that in this country, the more we denied ourselves, took up our cross, and followed him. If we did just what that one verse said, then we changed the nation. What's stopping us? That's the last thing I got to ask you. What's stopping us from doing what he said in verse 34? It ain't a law. It's just it's your own will. Right? The church is culpable in this, that it's our fault, it's not the government's fault, it's our fault that we stop doing what he said. Any questions, comments before I pray? Yes, ma'am. What was Paul meaning in Corinthians when he said, I die daily? Was he talking about physical death? No, 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 absolutely not. No, he didn't have that many lives with a cat. <laughs> uh, no, he was talking about the same thing. I died daily. He was, he was, he was talking about humility. Uh, again, what he, wrote, what he wrote in Philippians 2, and he said, you should have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a human being, being made in human likeness, you know, and being obedient to death, even death on the cross, what he says in you know, 5 through 11 and, and, and Philippians. That's what he was talking about, is humbling himself. I humble, I surrender myself every day, and do it exactly what Jesus, he, he was saying, I'm following what Ma Mark chapter 8 says. Yeah. Up Taking up his cross. And, and, and that man came to that realization after a lot of years of doing, doing things the, the, the other way. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, yeah, 
You, you, yeah, that's, that's the kind of stuff that just makes goosebumps come up on me because that's a level, that, that's what he's talking about. But you go, I hope, but I, 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 that's, that's, that's tough. But, but you hope to never be put in a situation, you know, that is like that uh, to where you really have to have a gun put to your head. But, but daily we do have circumstances that are like that, that we, we say, well, I don't want to say that in public because that coworker may not think well of me. They may think, you know, and that's the same kind of thing, being, being ashamed. Uh, you know, I have, found, I have found more times than not that people, people won't, they're looking for somebody who will boldly stand up and they'll join in, but they're looking for somebody who, who's got some boldness to them because everybody else is being ashamed. And if you'll do that, you'll find a lot more support that's out there uh, than, than you, really, you really think most of the time. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we do praise you and we thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word tonight. And, and Father, I just pray for me uh, and every person that is here tonight and every person that listens to this Bible study that we would really take in what it means uh, to, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow you. And the Lord, for, for us to recognize that during our lifetimes, there are going to ha be things in this world that we have to give up. There are going to be things, or relationships, um, there's going to be monetary and material things, relationships, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, Lord, there's going to be things that we're going to have to give up in this world uh, to, to follow you. And I just pray that we would continuously remember uh, what Andrew Murray wrote about humility and we would understand that, that that's what your scriptures in the context that they are written teach us, that we're to think about others more highly than ourselves, that we're to uh, take up our cross daily, that we're to die to ourselves, uh, that we're to have the former ways to be gone, that Lord, that you're looking for change in our life. And Father, I pray that you would use every single one of us in the sound of my voice tonight, that we would be the change in our sphere of influence. And Lord, we may not be able to change the tide of the entire world or our entire nation or this state or this city, but we can make an impact where you have placed us in our workplaces, in our homes, and in our families. And Father, I just ask that you use us as instruments of your will, that we would not be ashamed, and that we would boldly uh, take up our cross and follow you every single day. Go with us, Lord, as we leave this place tonight. Keep us safe. Bring us back on Sunday as we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.